this in person just as much as Gary does. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I am going to save you from too much purple. Uh, most of you in the room probably lean towards the zoo. In that case, stay to the white pad. But it is a pleasure to be with you. These slides, and I'm going to show you my last slide, it's actually the final. Uh, this is a public venue. You'll find a PDF of these slides on point with my website. I'll show you what that is when we're done. You're welcome to take as many notes as you want, but I tell you that up front, you don't have to write super fast, because everything I show you, you're going to have access to when we're done. I think it's important for a talk like this that I start by telling you what is my approach to answer the question, what is an economist's view on proposed policies in the live capital space? Capital space. That's really important because people are going to get different talks and you throw that kind of title and charge to speak. First and foremost, as noted, I'm a faculty member at Kansas State University. Most of my research and extension is in the meat and livestock space. I grew up in all farm in Monroe City. You know, my fingernails are cleaner than they were 25 years ago, but I come from them, right? Why do I highlight that? My view is, as an academic economist to educate the industry, often livestock producers, the industry in a broader sense, the best I can. Any analysis on any proposal on any industry is naturally going to have something that impacts one sector better than another. A winner versus a loser, if you like. It's not my job to pick a winner and loser. I refuse to do it if I'm an analyst at a university because I think that's not what society wants. That's really important to take note because some of the topics I've worked on before certainly aren't, you know, they're, they're plenty contentious. And it's not my goal to take people off. We don't think it that way. But I think it's my job to do the best research I can, present the facts, present the information the best I can, and at some point then politics takes over instead of economics. That's the reality of policy, right? I hope economics has a role in deciding what policies an industry has, but I'm not naive to the fact that it's not just economics. And politics and economics don't always point the same direction. So I very much get that. The second part of this is, and I think this room appreciates it, but it's important to remind us, U.S. ag is very big, very diverse. If we hone in just on beef cattle, that statement holds still. So I've listed some of the stakeholders, from seed stock all the way to end consumer. Every single one of those groups is also very diverse. The cow calf sector in Montana is different than southern Minnesota, Minnesota, than Missouri, than Florida, right? So there's a lot of diversity, scope, and frankly, there's economic importance of the beef cattle industry. And I don't think there's a single policy that's ever been proposed that would impact all those sectors the same. And we've got to take note of that. Most of today's meat discussion, and what I'm going to hold my, my comments around, are on the transition of cattle from feedlots to pack. That is the node in this industry that's the most contentious. I'm old enough to remember it's been the most contentious for a while. Several in the room are older than me, and you know that even before I was born, right? But what I want you to take from this comment about large and diverse, anything that we as society do that impacts that transaction of big cattle to packers, I'm going to tell you my opinion, has clear implications for every sector, not just big cattle buyers themselves. Third, as a trained economist, we tend to think about trade-offs. Simply today, I'm going to think benefit-cost. I'm going to talk about three potential policies specifically there. But I was trained to map out expected or best estimates of benefits versus costs. To present that in front of people, you know, whether it's senators, whoever it is, has a vote on something, and hope that helps them, but doesn't mandate they vote a certain way. Back to my distinction between economics and politics, right? At some point, politics takes over, but economists hopefully help by mapping out those benefit-cost. And I'm going to do some of that with you here today. I'm going to do that specifically on three policies and acts that are out there. Uh, raise your hand if you think it's boring in the cattle industry. This is a good way to make sure everybody's still awake at the lunch. All right, or at least truck ones here, so we'll wait. But we could have talked about 47 different things that are on the table. I'm going to talk about three. Two of these are not surprising ones I'm going to touch on. The third one might surprise you, but I'm going to try to connect before I'm done with the mic here why I'm talking about that. Okay? So, 5014, there's different names for these, that's probably the most common one in the media. It is sponsored by Grassley and Sessner. Fisher and Biden's Clinical Transparency Act is the second one, sometimes called the 3014 proposal. And then the EATS Act, which is the most recent one in addition to this list, it, um, our, our friends from Iowa are both sponsors on that. I'm going to touch on each of those specifically. But before I do, and if you heard me on my opening comments, my role here, I think it's really important to do a State of the Union. What are the topics in the industry that underlie those proposals? Understand what's going on, at least in the eyes of an economist, before you can go down the path of benefits and costs and pros and cons of any uh, particular policies. Packing for 
capacity, price discovery, enhancement or adjustment of LMR, livestock mandatory reporting, and interstate commerce, those topics are the core underpinning issues across these three policies. So I'm going to, the best I can in our short time here, give you a summary of what I think the status is or main issues on each of those to set the stage for how I think through these three specific policies. So first, the relationship between packing capacity, the ability to harvest more ready animals, convert them into edible human products, and the number of market ready fed cattle, is that number to number comparison, that relationship? I would argue is the most important relationship to describe market realities for the last at least two years. It's always important, but if you understand what's been going on in the market for the last two years, that relationship in particular is really important. I've talked at length about this. Uh, you know, Garrett, his kind remarks noted, I made a trip first time ever. I testified in front of the Senate DC in June. Uh, that's not the thing of art I hope I built. But that isn't the only one of those hearings. So I've listed four hearings up here. Uh, one was in Topeka, so it's a state level. The other three are either myself or other colleagues in the same profession that are testifying to the U.S. Senate and U.S. House. I highlight this because I don't have time to do a deep dive on all these. But if you have an interest in this topic, I encourage you to go to those hearings. I mean, they're recorded. You can hear them out. You can read the written testimony. You can do more homework. That's the point of that. But in every single one of those, not just me, but other economists that are listed here that will testify in, have honed in on the, how important this particular relationship is. So I'm going to take a couple moments to describe that relationship to you, at least the way I understand it. This is a chart from cattle tax, and I use it because it's the only uh, long-term series that I'm aware of that tries to match, estimate, market-ready fit cattle numbers, this is the annual, with our ability to harvest. Real simple example, there's a black bar across there, it goes back to 2005, the straight line is at 100%. So for a year where that value is 100%, Halifax's estimation, we have basically a quote unquote perfect match of the number of market ready fed cattle with our ability to harvest them on a quote unquote typical Monday through Friday harvesting schedule. So we kind of right size the industry to right at 100%, that's the way you think about that. When you have numbers above 100%, and please note 2020 was the extreme, that's 112%, that's a point in time, or those are years, where we have more cattle trying to get into the system on a Monday to Friday basis to bring them in. When you have values below 100%, the opposite is true, and we quote quite have extra hooks, right? So we got more capacity to harvest than we have cattle. So please note these bars change year over year. This series starts in 2005. If it went back to my birth year in 1980, I would submit the vast majority of those years before 2005 were below 100. And the reason I'm telling you that is the majority of our processing in this country big plants that harvest uh, market ready steers and peppers, 70s and 80s is when the bulk of that infrastructure was built. So there's been updates and tweaks, and you know, of course we've updated that infrastructure, but the bulk of it is quite old, and we run fewer animals through this industry than we used to, for lots of reasons. Super demand issues in the 80s and 90s, we get more pounds of beef by every animal, along with reasons for that. But we had decades where we had extra capacity, leading into this all the way up to 2015. You can see that's when it got the worst, and the story changed. 2016 is the first bar there, for those of you that are good at reading these things. This is the same chart, some more notes. In 2016, that's when the story flipped. That's when we had more cattle than we could handle in a typical Monday to Friday national harvesting perspective. Please note, 2016 is well before COVID. Right? Unfortunately, we're not five, six years into COVID. Don't take my comment that way. But this evolution of the fit of the capacity to harvest with the number of animals Predates COVID. Challenges, particularly a year ago last spring, of harvesting during COVID made that situation worse. But we had multiple years where the system was flush with capital, is the way to think about that. Why does all this matter? Economists will tell you when this is the situation, when you have more cattle than you can handle in a normal weekday process, the only way we handle them is to run Saturday and Park. That can be the system works. We've done that for some time as an industry. That in itself, is not supportive of big cattle prices because the cost structure of doing that is the same. I'm well aware of wholesale beef prices, we're going to talk about that in a moment, but you need to understand when you're above 100%, economists expect a bigger differential between a beef price measure and a cattle price measure. When you're below 100%, we expect a narrower one. And it really boils down to differences in the demand for fed cattle. The people that buy cattle to harvest them have a different demand schedule when the system's flush with cattle versus not flush with cattle. 
That's the punchline of that. The political reality is when you have that for three or four years, those that sell fed cattle don't like that. And I get that, right? I'm not saying I'm, I mean, I don't recognize that fully. Remember, I'm not a politician, I'm an economist. I'm highlighting that's the key relationship to appreciate. Now, these bars keep evolving. They evolve because if you change the number of cattle in the industry, or you change our capacity to harvest, either one of those, and that way they're both changing over time, we're at a different point. Fast forward to the right, our projection values, the red bars are projected. Basically, cattle facts is saying by 2023, we'll be at 100%. That reflects the expectation we're going to harvest fewer cattle, and we're adding more capacity to harvest, both of which will these bars down. I am very confident we're going to harvest fewer animals. That piece of it, I think, is pretty safe to say. There's a lot of announcements on adding capacity. I'm confident we're going to add capacity, but I'm less confident on how much. So there's five to 8,000 head per day of kind of pledged capacity that's on the table that would be added. I'll be very surprised if we get the upper end of that. So I think we're going to add some capacity, shrink the number of animals, get more right size. But I hope you understand why this relationship is important. This chart right here hopefully will drive this point home of why I think it's really important. The orange line is that same information. The bars from the past slide are now the line chart right here. That cattle facts how flush the system is. That's what the orange line is. The blue line is a relative price measure. Specifically, it's the live steer price relative to the comprehensive box feed price. There's a lot of different ways you can tell the story. Now I'm giving a relative beef and cattle price story. You will see that is varied over time, and for the last of my laser works, three or four years, it has definitely dropped down. Again, here's the political reality of that gets noticed. Okay? What I want you to take note of, though, as the economist trying to share information, is the relationship between these two lines, and why I've been saying that relationship of packing capacity relative to fake cattle numbers is really important. There's a very, very strong and, as expected, negative relationship between these two things. So, when we have more cattle going in than we can handle, right, that last chart, we're above 100%, we compress this blue line. That's the most simple way I would say that, okay? you are decreasing demand for fed cattle almost equal when that's the situation. The cost of running the second ship on the weekend is different than running the first ship on a Tuesday. Anyway, way, it's what that boils down to. You don't have downtime and so forth, okay? So this is not unexpected to folks like me. I fully understand the political reality that comes with it, but you just see economists and analysts, that is why I say the relationship between fed cattle numbers and packing capacity is very important to monitor and appreciate, okay? Those of you who know more on this, myself, Jason Lusk, who's at Purdue, Lee Schultz, who you guys heard uh, virtually at the same conference a year ago, I believe. Uh, we've worked a lot on COVID related things on this topic. You can go read our journal article, which full labors are in that it's in a much longer version. All right. The second thing that underpins at least the first two of those policies we're going to touch on is the notion of price discovery. And the reason I'm highlighting that is there's lots of calls to bump up the percentage of cattle that are spot negotiated in the big cattle market. Okay? The distinction between price discovery and price level is really important if you want to have a mature discussion on any of that, those components of those two policies. And I'll try to keep it jargon free. This is a PhD economist that needs to make it too jargony. That's, I don't want to do that here. But price discovery is the process of an individual buyer and an individual seller going back and forth and establishing a price. And I like to use an F-150 or Dodge pick up, even not pick up whatever your favorite flavor is in the room to make a point. If you could go buy average price across the country is 50 grand for your truck, that's a base price, a base price level that reflects supply and demand fundamentals in a broad sense. How many pickups did Ford kick out recently? Or God, whatever example you want to use, it takes the supply part of that. How many people like me and you in the room have an interest in buying it? Whether it's right off the doctor, right construction business, all those kind of things get into the demand side. But there's an aggregate story that pushes us towards a $50,000 kind of average price for those pickups. You follow me? But the reality is, not all pickups go for exactly 50 grand. They don't differ just because some have you know, a diesel engine or a gas engine or whatever. Those are distinctions of the product. But there's differences in price simply because the individual buyer and seller is in a different position. If I'm somebody who's trying to sell and I only have one on my lot, I'm not in a hurry to move it. If I got 50 on my lot and another truckload's coming, I'm in a different motivation perspective to move them, right? Same story on the demand side. This price discovery component and the base price level is mixed up. Price levels reflect in economist's eyes broad supply and demand fundamentals. Those of you that remember those bad days in microeconomics where beats like me through supply and demand lines, that's what I'm talking about. The base 
price and quantity outcome reflects aggregate demand and supply. Individual transactions is that process of price discovery. Unfortunately, those do get mixed up. And I'm not the only one who believes this, is the reason I include this slide. But most economists would tell you, and I've listed seven others here that share this opinion in a recent book, that's why I do it, that simply changing price discovery, simply increasing the percentage spot negotiating, this is a specific one for today's discussion, that itself doesn't guarantee anything about price level. It might make us more confident in the base value of capital. I mean, I'll admit that, that's possible, that's a possible benefit, but it does not guarantee anything that changes on base price level. Because that itself doesn't do anything about aggregate supply and demand. It doesn't change anything about consumers willing to pay for good rid of right? Working backwards from general demand. It doesn't do anything about the number of big cattle in the system. Think about general supply forces, okay? So there's a big and really important difference between discovery and base price level, price determination, that gets mixed up. Now, again, I'm trying to make a distinction between an economist's role and a politician's role on these topics of the policy that's really important to keep in mind. The reality for politicians is distinctions around price discovery and calls for action and how price discovery is not the same as price level is cyclical itself. There's a publication here from Beef Magazine that's dated the early 2000s. There's calls for change when farm meat prices are low. It's a political reality. And I think we all understand the human component that comes with that. Again, I came from a farm. I'm not anti-farm at all. Please don't take my comments out but the political reality is when farm meat prices are low, or they're being too low by some metric, there's calls for change to improve price discovery. We've been here before, is what I'm trying to tell you. Okay? Third component, LMR. So LMR, livestock mandatory reporting. Uh, if you do more homework on me, there's half a dozen projects I've done for USDA EMS trying to understand how they do LMR, not just for fed cattle, and someone wholesale pork, lamb, you, you name it. That's a program that didn't exist back when I was on farm. It's been around about 20 years now. And it's evolved a lot, but it's not well understood. It leads to a lot of confusion and calls for change. Could be more fruitful if it was more understood. So I'm going to make a couple of clarifying points here. First is what's the role of packers versus USDA versus the public or more generally users of USDA information? And those of us in this room would be users of USDA information in this example. We need to make a careful distinction between reporting by law large packers, those that are eligible, and it's the large packers and the feed side, cattle side, and so forth. They have to report information to AMS. And I will tell you my opinion, because I've signed in on you, I've seen the raw data. They do that by law. They do. So there's a form they have to populate. So every day there's a data dump from all the major packers that goes to USDA. The second step in that process is what does USDA do with that information? Okay, so Packers fully dumped, now USDA going through the process makes a decision what to do with it, that ultimately gives us some kind of public document. USDA report XYZ, right? There's a lot of those USDA documents out there. That printing or publishing information that USDA does is very valuable, and on balance, I think they do a good job, but it's ever evolving, and there's a, I'll call it a firewall, that's really a decision node, so all that raw data that's coming in, USDA has decision processes, how to use it. They operate where they're trying to protect the confidentiality of those that are sharing information. The 370-20 rule, we'll talk about the Q&A, we can, that's what's going on there. They also get feedback on whether the documents they're publishing are valuable. So if they put out the same report for three years and nobody downloaded it, they'll quit doing it. If they get a lot of requests for new documents, sometimes they respond. Here in August they have, so there's two new reports. What I want you to take from this brief education on LMR, there's been no change in the last few months about what packers are sharing with USDA. They're doing the exact same data dump by law, completing basically the same electronic form. What's changed during the month of August so far is USDA is putting out two new documents. So they're sharing additional information out of that raw data dump for those of you who are following. Okay? So it's a really important distinction between the raw data dump and packers quote unquote sharing information with USDA and what USDA does with it. That's what I'm trying to clarify here. Quick note that LMR is up for reauthorization. It's under a one-year extension as we speak. I anticipate it will either have another one-year extension or it will be reauthored. My last one of these points, I'm kind of set the stage for these policies. We need to appreciate, remember I grew up in a hog farm in Missouri, northeast Missouri, it is Missouri is a net exporter of live animals and protein. There's a lot more protein produced within this 
eight quarters, and then it's consumed within these eight quarters. Right? That is okay. You have a bigger ag sector because of it. Right? There's demand for those products outside the state border. Specifically to cattle, let's compare the resident population. Roughly 2% of the U.S. population resides in Missouri. Conversely, about 7% of the beef cows. Less than 1% of the feedlot. So, we all know this, but to be very clear, Missouri is made way more of a cow calf state than it is a feedlot state. Conversely, go down to the bottom, say Nebraska, you can say the opposite. Okay? So, state by state, got different stories here. Why am I telling you this? Interstate relationships, in this example, Missouri partnered with somebody else where those cattle tend to get more weight put on them and harvested is important. And understanding where those beef products go when they leave that plant is important because that all connects back to the value of often your six weight you know, steers in Missouri. All right, so back to these bills. The first one is the 5014 bill. comments that's in that bill, if I included it up here, and I put links on this for those of you who want to do more homework later, you can click on a hyperlink and pull up my slides, of the volume that's slaughtered by a covered packer, and again, a covered packer is a large packer, unless there's some exemptions to get them off, which we'll talk about in a second. Every reporting week at each plant, that covered packer shall report no less than 50% of their volume through spot, you know, traditional negotiated markets. I underline the key parts of that. Every week, every plant, at least 50%. There are several details that matter there. It would not include a pack that only has one plant. That's relevant because we're talking about maybe adding high capacity industry, so this is one, two is or isn't covered. It doesn't include other species, nor does it include dairy beef cross. That's important because the role of dairy beef cross is growing nationally, at least in the industry. I'm not advocating for those to be changed, by the way. I'm giving you examples where details really matter if you're going to do good benefit cost making policy. Non-affiliated producers, that's who they have to buy at least 50% of the volume via the spot market from, can't own more than 1% of the plant. One of the implications for an economist would be is now we're making it harder for livestock producers to invest vertically in the chain. That would be a natural outcome if this kind of policy went forward because you no longer could do that. Okay? Again, I'm not, it's not my job to say don't do that, but economists highlight those implications of some of these policies. So what are my thoughts on some of these benefit costs? You're going to see red bold question marks next to each of these comments. I was asked to kind of opine on the benefit cost. Full benefit cost assessments need to be done on each of these. The second one, to its credit, actually is calling for that, but even the first one is needed. There's a possible benefit. If the fake cattle market today is quote unquote too thin, and that phrase would mean if we don't truly have enough cattle to be in negotiating spot markets, I'm talking from a national perspective here when I say this, then something that increases the volume that is in the spot market could be beneficial. So we got to recognize that when you have a benefit cost of a proposal like this as a possible benefit of bumping us up to 50% in spot negotiated. On the cost side, the downside, if you like, well, there's an incurred cost that's going to depend on exactly how it's implemented. So, what exactly are we as an industry or society going to do to verify every week, every plan to meet 50%? Exactly what transaction costs come with that would be really important. Okay? There's more than that, but there's just physical transaction and documentation, verification cost that would come with something like this. We'd have to take note of it. Second point up here is we have to recognize there was a time when 50% of the cattle were spot negotiated, but over multiple decades, the industry evolved away from that. Several buyers and sellers of the cattle chose to move away from that. So sort of by definition, that's the revealed preference for those cattle, not for everybody in the industry, but for those cattle that used to spot negotiate but don't anymore, if we go back to spot negotiating, those particular partners, that buyer, seller, on each side of that, they almost by definition incur a cost. Because before this bill was in place, they were voluntarily choosing to do something else. What doesn't get much talk, but I think is equally important, very hard to quantify, but really important to recognize, is what would it do to the incentive to feed cattle, genetically investing cattle, to align the output of those fed cattle with consumer demand savings. In my opinion, one of the main reasons, not the only one, but one of the main reasons that we have more formula and board contract cattle today than we did 30 years ago is an interest to align consumer interest with what we produce and how we produce. That's not impossible, but it's a lot harder to do in a spot negotiated arena. And I get concerned we'll not have as good of alignment between consumer demand and what we produce. And my real concern is in the industry from the 80s and 90s when we have a professional demand problem. That's the reason for that point. So that belongs on the cost side of the ledger. What about 
Fisher Widens Transparency Act. This doesn't have a specific number. 30% floats around, but the reality was called for a regionally varying minimum. The reason for that is that here today, most of you probably know, the typical week there's more cattle spot negotiated in Iowa than there is Texas, and Kansas and Nebraska different spots and so forth. So this bill recognizes that difference and calls for different minimum thresholds. It's a little more complicated than the one before because of that, but it recognizes some differences already exist regionally. It calls for us to create a library marking contracts. It calls for packers to have the report, share information with USDA on the number of cattle are going to be uh, harvested. They plan to harvest each in the next 14 days. And the fourth point, it prohibits USDA from using confidentiality as a reason not to share a number. So like if you're in Colorado in particular, it's pretty common today to pull up a USDA document. It'll say NR, can't report, because it's a confidentiality concern on USDA's perspective they're not printing a number. This would say you can't do that, but yet at the same time the act says you've got to still protect confidentiality. So I don't know how you do point four. It's, I'm not a lawyer, but it seems very hard to me how you don't use confidentiality as a reason not to print, but you've got to maintain confidentiality. I don't know how you do so. And that's why I include that particular point here on my benefit cost piece. So the regionally minimum threshold of negotiating, the details will really matter exactly how you do that. NCPA has a process they're a fan of. I'm not going to say it's right or wrong. There's some specific policies out there to do that. At the end of the day, the benefit cost will matter. If the market's too thin and we need more spot negotiating, there's a possible benefit for us. If the magic number in the industry is 32%, and we get something like that from this policy, but we don't have curly cost of going to 50, then this would be better. It's a simple way to make that point, right? Please notice I said if, because the academic community is not convinced yet that there's a clear national price discovery problem. There's concern regionally, but nationally, there's not the analyst view that we come to need more spot negotiation. There's a call for it politically, but it's the analyst perspective, that's not a universally accepted fact. Okay? On the contracts, the cost of providing a contract library, I think, are reasonably low. So the cost of implementing that not only be very high. There could be some benefits to that. This is motivated because we have that on the swine side. I think the expected benefit is overstated. We talked about that in QA if you want. But there's a possibility for a positive benefit cost on that component of this act. The confidentiality one, as I said, I think it's self-inflicting. I don't know how you can it. As it relates to these, my five minutes. The EADS Act, which is an acronym for Exposing Agricultural Trade Suppression. Uh, sidebar, I don't have the company's name. It's always interesting how to do that. But uh, you can read down here, one of the sentences in here, to prevent states and local jurisdictions from interfering with the production and distribution of ag products in interstate commerce. I think the political reality of this act comes from in California, Proposition 12. If nothing changes from today till January 1st, if you want to sell pork in California, it's got to come from a system that complies. Proposition 12 in Iowa in particular is a major exporter both within our country, outside of Iowa, as well as the rest of the world. And today we don't have enough pork in the U.S. that's producing the way that we be compliant. So you'll notice who sponsored this act. I'm not saying I'm for against this act. Hopefully you recognize I'm not for against either one of the other two. I'm sharing my thoughts out of thinking through it. But I share this with you because I encourage those in the room to recognize it's not just about things in the thick out of space. The U.S. beef industry. Missouri beef industry, the Missouri cow calf sector, and how Mary to go here, is impacted by a lot of things. And we've got to be aware of there's a lot of calls for change, and even things like this that might change the interstate commerce are very important. So please be aware of more than just calls to change big cow marketing. That's the reason I included here. Those are the ones that are most needed, and I think why I was asked to be here today. But there's a lot of other policies that are on the table we also need to track. My last two slides, and we're tracking on time just fine. I think the U.S. beef cattle industry is at a crossroads. It's been here before, but it's really important crossroads. The industry's got to decide where it collectively wants to go. My assessment of the situation today is like what I have in front of you. It's a house being pulled apart. The industry collectively. There's a lot of divisions in the industry. I told the story at the fed cattle level. Those that sell fed cattle versus those that buy it. But there's a lot of divisions in every level. Okay? A lot of it boils down to an argument over today's economic pie. So I include an example down here, a pile of dollar sign a lot of hands on. Things like market share statistics and the like very quickly fall into this bucket. I know why we do that, it's easy to measure things that way. But I genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, think the industry would be better off, and 
was my son Naive who got from the belief to be better off. If it matured and got better at pulling together towards a common goal. So the reason I advanced to the next slide. A, there's a bigger pie on the cart, right? B, it's all going one direction. There's not a rope pulling left and a different rope pulling right. Okay? To work together to grow the pie. That might sound like a naive comment to some in the room, and I'll half apologize if it does, but I firmly believe the industry collectively working together to chase more resources would be better for everybody. At any one point in time, one sector can be different and benefit more than others, but collectively, you think generations of your operation, setting the industry up to work together, be bigger and more prosperous, I firmly believe is what needs to occur. Okay? Now, that's the economist. Politician has a specific point in time every two and four year elections and so forth, right? 